Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. You know how much I appreciate you giving me a bit of your time every week. This is an excellent topic. With me is Peter Kears, like beers with a K is what he told me. And he is a subject matter, mostly expert on navigating the uh, cost of long-term care. He started researching the options at age 65, which led him to write an ebook, which we will have linked in the show notes. And he's going to tell us what he discovered in hopes that he can help you navigate your later years the best way possible. Thanks for, blah, good. (laughs) Oh no, my tongue's going on strike. Thanks for, thanks for joining me, Peter. Well, thanks for having me, Jennifer. I'm really glad to be here. Tell you a little bit about how I came up with this uh, idea. Uh, I work with some uh, colleagues on a website called Cantissimo Senior Living, and it's a very broad-based um, website that talks about a lot of senior issues and so forth. And among those was Medicaid, Medicare, and then thinking about how about long-term care? How do people, how do people afford that? And I had that question for myself. Uh, I had some personal experience with that uh, idea. My mother-in-law uh, was in a, an assisted care facility and then went into skilled nursing care. And even before that, she was getting uh, assisted living type of services at home. And the way to pay for that was out of her own pocket for the most part. And it became readily apparent that uh, even though she had and her husband, who was was deceased prior to her, had saved up a fair amount of money, uh, it was quickly dwindling. And because there had been no... uh, uh, long-term thinking about how, how to talk about long-term care. So uh, it, uh, that interested me, and I wanted to say uh, to myself and to uh, the audience that I write for, uh, hey, maybe it's a good idea to plan for some of this uh, to the best extent possible. Unfortunately, most of us don't even start thinking about planning until we're pretty much, as far as I understand, too far down the road. Um, years ago, I talked to a gentleman about long-term care insurance, really thought that'd be like a dud episode. People loved it. So obviously this is a good topic. And, you know, he was really advising people to start long-term care insurance plans, you know, in their late twenties, early thirties. And I thought I was lucky I had enough money to pay all the bills back then. (laughs) And I think that's a great point, Jennifer. Uh, LTCI, as the acronym for it goes, is uh, a great option. But one of the things that uh, people think about is uh, I have a lot of other things earlier in life to think about. And by the time that I am really concerned about it in my 50s or 60s, the cost is uh, prohibitive for a lot of people. So that is it. That is an issue for one of the ways of uh, financing your long term care. I think we need to have more conversations with working adults, I guess, is the right term. Younger people than us explain that, you know. This is just as important as life insurance. You know, in our 30s, we don't ever think that we're going to use our life insurance anytime soon. And hopefully that's the case for most people. But, you know, if we don't use our life insurance early on, then we're definitely going to probably need long-term care insurance or some of the other methods of payment that we're going to talk about today. So what is it that you uh, discovered besides uh, at 65, long-term care insurance was not not a viable option for you? Well... What I, what I discovered in my exploration of this topic was the fact that it's really a very high percentage of people are going to have some kind of long-term care needs. Now, the, the stereotype is that, hey, I'm going to end up in a nursing home and I have to prepare for that. Well, that's, yeah, that's a possibility. But there's a range of things that could be costing money when you get to the age where you do need some kind of care. And uh, they range uh, all the way from having people come into your home to help you. Uh, you say you haven't moved yet, and it, and it may be your family. And that's another really good point in this whole discussion about family as caregivers. 
And I know that's a, a subject near and dear to your heart. Uh, but if there are uh, paid caregivers, there's going to be some cost. Uh, and then uh, if the it's decided that, hey, I, maybe I should move out of my home, then there are various stages in that particular situation too. Every one uh, of those has some cost attached to it. And uh, the more intensive the care needed, of course, the higher the, the cost. So uh, I, that's kind of a, a natural idea. Yeah, if I need a lot of care, it'll cost a lot. If I don't need so much, maybe not so much. But the whole idea is to keep the whole range of things in mind and then talk about to yourself, what are the various levels of risk that I might face and how should I prepare for that? I don't think um, I'm going to have to check to see if this statistic is still true or if it's changed, increased, but 70% of us will need care before we die. And, uh, and I that's laugh. A, yep. Yep. Um, that's a good, a good one. And like I said, I need to check cause I bet you it's higher. And I bet you that 70%, maybe 72 or 3%. I'll have to do some digging, but I yeah. kind of laugh because I think a lot of people, I think most of us assume we're going to be in that 30%, but nobody acknowledges that the 30% may have, died young, died suddenly, you know, many people live to a ripe old age and don't need much care. That'd be great. That's my plan. Um, although it's not very good financially to only assume that I'm going to go that way. And mm -hmm. I think knowing that most of us will need some type of care, one, more people need to understand that, but it also sure. helps us realize what you were saying that there's a, you know, there's a spectrum of, of care needs to, you know, maybe just some simple things like my paternal grandmother was mostly blind from glaucoma. And so she needed somebody to do some light housekeeping, meal prep, um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. driving her around. She didn't need, that's about all she needed. And even though she resisted all that anyway, <laughs> so that's a whole how, other how topic. Is, I think it's a good point. Uh, that story, how long did she need those kind of services? Do you recall? <sighs> Um, well, my grandfather died at the end of 97, and she died in April of 21. So however long that was, most of that time, yep. definitely yep. from 2005 to th 2021, or she sure. moved into board and care home in July of 2020 and passed yes. away April of um, 21. In 2005, she fell and hit her face on the good eye and damaged the retina in her good eye. So from oh, 2005 no. forward, oh, um, no. her visual impairment was greatly increased. So for definitely, mm -hmm. you know, about 20 years. And she pretty much burned out my aunt, who was her daughter-in-law. Yes. You know, yes. I don't think and anybody, the, I don't think we plan that our, mm -hmm, yep. I don't think we plan that our, our parents are going to live to be 103. <laughs> <laughs> that's unusual, but still, uh, that's a there are potential. I think there's some genetic factors and things that you can have some uh, idea of what you might be up against. But the fact uh, the fact that you mentioned, or the uh, that uh, seventy percent of us are going to need something, uh, Health and Human Services figures from 2020 bear that out. Uh, in a survey that they did, uh, they said 69 percent of us will need something, some level. Uh, it might be small, it might be uh, more intense. And also, as you, and you alluded to as well, uh, your relative went through stages. She needed light help in the beginning. And as she progressed in age, she needed heavier help and, and perhaps couldn't even live in her own home. So then the percentages go down. So for example, uh, the 69% is for any but if you look at just skilled nursing where someone needs 24-hour care and they need to be in a skilled nursing facility, only, well, only 35% of people uh, use that. So it's still about a third who may end up using some pretty intensive services. Uh, that's still something to prepare for. And uh, the numbers are also, uh, the other thing that I explored as well, okay, here's the potential risk from a, will it happen? Well, what what are the costs that are ex in this particular situation? And just like in the, the spectrum of it happening, uh, the cost is lower when there are fewer services, obviously, and higher when there are more services. So, for example, uh, in uh, 2020, the average adult daycare, that's the, the lowest level of help. This is when 
uh, an elder would go to a, a location for a daycare to give their caregiver some respite and so forth. That can run up as high as $19,000 a year just for that kind of service, uh, adult daycare. Uh, then you ramp it up all the way to the other end of the spectrum where you have skilled nursing in a private room, um, and that could be up to over $100,000. Uh, a semi-private room is not far behind. It's somewhere around 90000 And I also weave in there, um, when you get to that level, uh, memory care is around the same level. Uh, upwards, you're looking at $100,000 a year in some cases. So uh, depending on what part of the country you're in and what, uh, how fancy, if that's the right word for it, uh, the facility is, uh, you can be talking about a major drain on resources uh, for an individual who's faced it uh, with paying this. And there was a post, so like a social media kind of sharing going on um, in April, right around tax day, about people were saying what they'd spent on caregiving costs. Now, my mom was in memory care for three years and two weeks. So I thought, well, let me just figure out what that cost. And it was over a quarter of a million dollars, which almost made me gag. Now, my mom's care, when she moved in, was $5,600. That covered everything, room, board, meals. Um, it didn't include, obviously, personal items or uh, toiletries or any of that stuff just completely understandable. And in March of 2020, when she fell and broke her leg, March is the month she moved in. So they'd already done an assessment of her and they did the assessment based on her needs after the, the leg break and her costs were going to go from 5,600 to 7,200. And being from a very frugal hearted family, <laughs> I really honestly think my mom had a moment of clarity by herself. And she thought, well, there's this COVID thing happening. Nobody really understands that. And, you know, they're going to charge me $7,200 to live here. Yeah, no, I'm out because she literally died March 31st. The new new fee was to take place April 1st. So, you know, it was, it was a little rough time, but, you know, there was a few silver linings. And, you know, previous to that, I also shared in the same um, posting, sharing, whatever you want to call it, was that my dad, my, when my dad was on hospice, now he had, he was in kidney failure, which, um, poisoned his brain for lack of a more medical term. And so he had dementia. My mom had advanced Alzheimer's. That was fun times. So we needed 24 seven caregivers in the early months of 2017. And it was mm -hmm. over $700 a day, which is wow. much more money than the memory care. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that was a chunk of cash. <laughs> yes, yes, and and that's the kind of thing that um, uh, is the the great uh, huge unknown out there in the future. And I think that that brings up the whole question about why is it that people don't plan for long term care expenses? Uh, one of the things I mentioned in the ebook is that we're more likely, by far, to save up and plan for our children's college education uh, than we will for this. And uh, there was a great quote from a Morningstar financial analyst. And she said, if you uh, were told that there was a 50% chance in your retirement years that your house would burn down, wouldn't you do something about it ahead of time? And uh, that's the whole idea is that if there's at least a 50% or more chance that you'll have some kind of uh, long-term healthcare needs around, around there, planning for it, or at least being aware of what the possibilities are is a good thing. That makes sense. And as a person who lives in Northern California, I live an hour South of Lake Tahoe. Um, many people may remember the mosquito fire that happened last year. That was yes. 16 miles, yep. I think to the East of us. Mm -hmm. Um, Spent Labor Day weekend in the house with the windows tightly sealed because the air was brown. <laughs> so when you yep. said, you know, if we knew that we had a 50% chance of our house burning down, I was like, oh, I wonder what our percentage is. <laughs> we do, yeah, I think we, in your neighborhood, there might be a, a little more risk involved. There is, but we are in a fire-wise community. So there's a lot. I mean, that's good. I swear, between this crazy winter we've had with all the rain and then it warms up for just long enough and it's been crazy. Um, they have cut down more trees, which, you know, sure. kind of breaks my heart a little bit, but 
some of these trees have been a nuisance. They've they've taken out power lines, they've taken out transformers. Sure. So yeah. they're they're doing the right thing. You know, we do have defensible space and all that, but you know, still uh, might want to watch. check it. <laughs> Yeah, Hard it'll be watch. interesting to see. Let's see, I got 46 more years to live to 103, so we'll see. <laughs> well, uh, the, the, the big thing that comes up and the question after all this awareness of uh, high cost and high probability is, well, why don't people plan more for this? And there's a few reasons. Um, despite the fact that people uh, may read about the potential risk of having to have these costs and maybe even in their own family or people they know uh, uh they have at least anecdotal evidence that uh, hey this can be a really f- a big financial burden on people nevertheless it's almost like people want to put their fingers in their ears and kind of go la 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 and and uh, it's too much to take uh another uh thing is that people assume that uh, government programs like Medicare or Medicaid will cover the cost. If it really comes down to it, uh, I'll, I'll, it'll, they'll pay for it. And there's some nuances to that. There, to some degree, that's true. It actually is Medicaid and not Medicare, but uh, that that has some uh, important things to know about that, and we can talk about that. Uh, another thing is that people assume that their family will step in. Oh, I don't have to worry about it. My my family will take care of me and all that kind of thing. And I think that was a more of a for sure type of thing in the past. Nowadays, I think it's more difficult for families to to do that. Although that's the majority of uh, where caregiving is coming from, is for uh, from family members. Uh, Thirty seven million family members uh, provide paid uncare, uh, unpaid care to their relatives, uh, according to uh, statistics from like about 2020. So yep. family caregivers are, we're va- qu- quickly approaching a trillion dollars in unpaid, in unpaid yes. care. Yes. That's, that's a, a big, big number. That's a huge number. That's a huge number. And that just shows you the scope of, of what's going on out there. So that's, that's a thing to keep in mind. Um, and then also, uh, folks think, well, my retirement savings and pension, I've been diligent about saving and I should have, I should, that should help. That should be able to do it. And that's good. Um, if you saved a lot, a lot of people have not though. And uh, what will happen uh, is to, to think about it, that is a finite resource. So that only will go so far. So uh, that's another thing to, to, to think. So all these things are, yes, they're all possibilities. Uh, that you won't need it, that the government will cover it, that your family will help you out and your retirement savings will be enough. But just saying, yeah, that should be good enough. Uh, I think it, it's worthwhile to look into it a little deeper and do some serious planning about what to do. Yep. Most people end up using the their home. They sell it. Like we rented yes. out my parents' home. It was paid for, thankfully. So we just had to pay the homeowner's insurance and the landscaper um, while it was rented out. And so between renting out the house, uh, mom's house was in the San Francisco Bay Area suburbs, the kind of the far flung suburbs. Her Social Security, which basically was increased because she had the what do they call that? The the spousal. Oh, the spousal one. Yeah, Yeah. 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 She. Her her social security increased tremendously after my dad died, which is kind of yeah. weird, but I get it. Um, that covered, so that was about forty six hundred dollars, and I said the memory care was fifty six hundred dollars. So thankfully, my dad did have investments. Again, like I said, super yep. frugal family to the point of sometimes being stupidly cheap, and that paid the rest of her. I mean, she had plenty of money, but I being like my dad worried constantly that we'd run out of money at the time that she would have needed the most physical hands-on care, which, yes. you know, thankfully did not happen. Um, she had plenty of money regardless. I just was always a worry because when you're a family member spending a lot of time in memory care, you see people who have to move a loved one out because they've run out of money or yes. it's, yes. Not a, it's not a, a good that's scenario. That's almost a worst case scenario, really, when you think about it. And that doesn't mean that their loved one doesn't need care anymore. It simply means that they have to go somewhere else that might not be as good. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
or might have to go home and then the family has to do the caregiving, which is really uh, a tough situation. Yeah, it's a lot harder to take on when they're in the later stages than earlier on. It was like my dad did the majority of the caregiving. And after he died, it was like, whoa, there's a lot of stuff I don't know, which was shocking. That was actually harder to deal with almost than his death because, you know, I needed to do the best for my mom. And all of a sudden I, I realized that my knowledge was really lacking. Yes. Yes. And I think a lot of people who have uh, memory care on their plate find that out, especially as the disease progresses. Mm -hmm. So what else did uh, you discover? Well, I, I thought about what are the what are the things, the ways that we can pay for this uh, care? And there's personal resources, government payments, and long-term care insurance. These are all three things that we've uh, discussed so far. And that's a good way to think about the buckets, the potential buckets that you might have at, at your uh, disposal in a situation like that. Um, the the way to, to think about it uh, in, in terms of personal resources is, okay, what are the things that I could draw upon potentially from my personal resources? And they will be, as you mentioned, Social Security. Uh, you might have a pension from your company. Not as many people have pensions from their companies anymore, but but that's a good thing because in most cases, if you do, that's a as long as you live kind of thing. Uh, if you have money uh, in 401ks or traditional uh, IRAs, that's another way. There's also uh, regular savings, Roth IRAs. Uh, another people thing people don't think about also is in life insurance and annuities. Um, uh, life insurance is a, a way that people can use to pay for long-term care because you can get a rider on a life insurance policy that covers long-term care. And uh, I discovered some things about that that are interesting uh, versus traditional long-term care, which is pure long-term care. Um, there's also a way to use health savings accounts uh, to help pay for long-term care. And then, uh, as you mentioned, uh, using your home equity in some way, using your home as you in your mom's case, uh, you can either sell a home, you can rent it, you can do a reverse mortgage, you can do what's called a home equity line of credit. Those are all ways to leverage uh, the value of your home. So when a person is looking over, over their, their overall financial resources personally, what they've got in that bucket, those are all the different categories that they can look at to say, okay, what can I draw upon? And as it turns out, uh, the Health and Human Services reported in 2016 that about uh, of long-term care expenses that were paid, 53% um, uh, came from personal resources. So people were paying uh, at least half of that in, in when you look at it in total. Now, individual person, it depends, but on a national basis, that's where the money was coming from. Yeah, I don't know if that's good or bad. It's kind of kind of a mixed mixed statistic. I mean, it's good yeah. that that we're we're not expecting somebody else to cover it a hundred percent because that's not super healthy for the our, our economy. But it's so expensive. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, I think it would be a higher percentage if we could somehow. Uh, reorient the costs. Somebody's making money in these businesses, oh, yeah. but it wasn't the caregivers where my mom lived. Most, the a couple of them that I was really close to literally worked eight hours in the morning at Starbucks and then went and worked eight hours at the memory care, which pff, if I That's, did that, I would have zero patience for those people in the memory care. Yes. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now, fruit usually did the trick, but not always. 
One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. And that's a, that's a problem um, in that whole industry. Uh, in the work that I do uh, for Cantissimo Senior Living, we do look at a lot of some of those background issues in the long-term care industry. And uh, staffing is a huge problem right now. COVID just put a complete uh, uh, smackdown on uh, staffing for those uh, institutions. And they're still trying to recover from that. Uh, and to attract more workers, uh, costs of paying those people goes up, and therefore the overall cost of long-term care goes up. So it's a it's a it's a tough situation. Yeah, I don't know. Something's something's got to change with that because obviously the caregivers weren't getting paid enough. And I know our executive director that ran the community. I mean, ugh, there's no way that guy got paid enough because. He had to deal with the staff. He had to deal with the assisted living residents and the assisted living residents' families and the memory care residents and the memory care residents' families. Yes. And, ah, yes. It was way too many people to deal with. And I swear every time I, I ran into that man, there was somebody pulling on his ear with a complaint. It's like, ugh. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. And he wasn't driving like the latest and greatest car or dressing in the snappiest no. suits. Nope. He, no. he looked no. like the rest of us. Yeah. It's hard to uh, hard to imagine where all the money goes uh in a situation like that but uh um you know it's it's it is a big problem and uh where are the cost drivers in this whole situation. Um yeah, it's not about, an easy solution. Yeah, thinking about government programs, I mentioned that uh Medicare doesn't pay for long-term care. There is a a, a slight exception to when I say that. So if uh I'm in the hospital and uh, I'm over 65 and I have Medicare. Uh, if I require, per my doctor's orders, a t t time of rehabilitation after my hospital stay, let's say I broke my hip and, and uh, I have to uh, recover from that, the plan would be for me ultimately to go home, but I can't do it right away. I can spend up to 100 days in a long-term care facility that will help me with my uh, therapy and all that kind of thing. And the whole idea is that ultimately I'll go home. Medicare will pay for that. Uh, uh, believe it or not, there's crazy uh, nuances to that whole thing. One of them is it has to be a three-day stay in the hospital beforehand. If for some reason I'm only in for two days, Medicare won't cover the long-term care afterwards. It has to be three days. And the hospitals are aware of that, and they will sometimes hang on to people a little bit to make sure they hit that um, just so that they, when they go to long-term care, they, they can be covered. Um, but that's about the only thing that Medicare covers. Uh, it doesn't mean that when you're in a long-term care facility that your Medicare coverage doesn't come into play. It does, but it doesn't pay for the things that you need in the long-term care facility, like assistance with uh, eating, or if you need uh, help uh, getting dressed or anything like that, Medicare doesn't cover any of that. Uh, that's where if, if your finances go down to a level where you cannot afford it anymore, then Medicaid kicks in. And Medicaid is the uh, healthcare program that covers about 75 million Americans uh, this is everybody from low-income adults, children, pregnant women, disabled, and seniors who are in long-term care facilities. Um, it's it's paid for by both a combination of the federal government and the state, and the states and each state administers it. So uh, there's a lot of re regulations and rules about it. But the bottom line is, uh, if you need long-term care and you don't have any money, then uh, if the state ag agrees with their rules that you're at a certain income level, they will cover your long-term care expenses. Um, 
but if you have too much money and you and you are but you still you're you're doing a you end up doing a thing called asset spend down so the government uh wants to get you to be at a certain level of assets before you can be eligible and therefore they keep uh when you apply they keep track of how many assets you have and this this could include your home but there's an there's an uh a caveat about that and as a result then you have to spend down your assets to a certain level and then you become eligible but uh if you're living in your own home that doesn't count that's not part of your assets that they'll count you can have one vehicle if you have prepaid funeral expenses they don't go after that if you have uh life insurance policies uh that don't have uh more than a fifteen hundred dollars in cash value if you have a term insurance policy uh your household and personal items and your like jewelry and fa- family heirlooms none of that gets calculated in the asset part however uh thinking about the home if uh, uh, a person sells their home then it becomes part of the the Medicare equation. So somebody could theoretically be uh, collecting Medicaid payments for their long-term care, and then they sold their home. All of a sudden, they were had cash infusion, and the Medicaid would say, "Time out! You've got assets." So they they stop paying until those assets are paid out uh, from the proceeds of the home, and then they'll start up again. So. Those are the kind of things that people run into. Do you know if that would include, like in our scenario where we rented out mom's house? Oh, now that's a good point. Uh, actually, you are able to rent rent the home. It, it is an income, but the, the income from that rental becomes part of the uh, assets that are, are out there. So in other words, uh, the rent has to be used for long-term care expenses uh, for your fair. medical expenses. Yes, and that's what you did. Mm-hmm. You, you use that rent to to supplement the income and, and be able to afford that. So that's that is a way, and that goes back to the whole: uh, how can I use my equity in my home to help finance this? And, and that's a, again, that, that gets that gets sorry. back to the variety of things that you can do along those lines. Renting out your loved one's home is not necessarily the thought pe- most people have most people just say i got to sell mom's home to pay for memory yes. care or assisted living yes. my husband is a real estate broker and it wasn't the reason we ended up renting out mom's home versus selling it which thankfully we didn't sell it in 2017 we sold it in 2020 i think we all know what happened to the real real estate market in those 3 years yep is a cpa friend of ours said now wait a minute isn't your mother-in-law's house paid for my husband says yeah and he goes you should rent it out and my husband went duh He's not only a real estate broker; he's got a property management business. And you were so, in the and you're and you're in the Bay Area, mm-hmm. you know, with that house, which has made it one of the most prime rental markets in the country. So yeah, when when we sold it, so we sold it in July of 2020. So it was literally 50 years and one month old. Built in 1970, you know, had some had a tiny kitchen, had some. Sure quirky things. It wasn't the open floor plan most people desire, but it was right across the street from an elementary school. And so that was, that was a plus in a safe town. And we sold it for almost $700,000. I was like, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm like, this house is not worth that kind of money. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It, it had a large yard. It back, it had only one neighbor on one side. It backed up to open space um, on two sides. So um, the school could be a bit of an issue at times, but you know, it was just like the staggering amount of money we sold it for just, it felt criminal. It really did. Well, but that was the market. That's the market at the time. I think another thing too, Jennifer, in that rental situation is that that's a great option, but the family who's going to be handling the, the landlording activity uh, needs to be ready for being a landlord. And that's not uh, uh, a rent and forget kind of thing. It is uh, something that uh, you're on call and there may be any number of things that might come up. Sometimes it's an easy situation with a good renter and a, and a great property, but uh, there can be other problems as well. So it's a great option, but uh, you got to be realistic about what the, the overhead for that is. And my husband actually has quite a few 
property management clients that are in the same scenario we were in. They are yep. caring for a parent and they they're using the asset of the parent's home to cover the care and it is well worth the small investment to have a property manager. Cause let me yep. tell you, you know, he, he knows people like contractors and, you know, we had yes. all this rain, roofs are leaking, trees are falling down, fences are falling down. He knows he's got all the people to call. So yes. it's just worth it to to consider that. And they if you get the right property manager, they'll get you the right renter. And we had a great renter for three years. I felt terrible that we were selling the house out from under them. They they were that good. I felt guilty we were that's throwing a, them out of risky. our house. <laughs> yeah, I think actually you're bringing up a great point about the property management angle there because that could be something if someone was considering renting that would that extra cost may be well worth it as you're saying if you get the right person yeah. it should be yeah. uh, another way that people are, are using their homes to generate some money is with a call a reverse mortgage uh, if one has to be over 62 years old to take advantage of that and they are very complicated types of uh, instruments but uh, it is another angle, another way that people can uh, be able to use that equity that's sitting there. It's And as you mentioned, if you own the house free and clear, it's very much easier decision. If there's still a mortgage on the house, the mortgage can be paid off by the reverse mortgage, but then you have fewer proceeds to devote to the, uh, the long-term care expenses. And uh, the other way is that with a home equity line of credit. Uh, there are good things about that too, but on the other hand, uh, it can be complicated as well because that one, you will have to start paying that back more quickly than, uh, say, a reverse mortgage. So, a lot of, so lot all of good options to, that someone yeah. should think about ahead of time. A lot of things to contemplate, and that's why this conversation is so good because you're putting it all out there. I've talked to Medicaid specialists and long-term care insurance people but i haven't really had anybody lay it out a hundred i mean like you're you're covering multiple conversations in one episode if that makes sense <laughs> well it's a it's a broad subject very broad subject and uh each one could be an episode in and of itself uh there are so many details that i i cover in the ebook and even in the ebook, it's a 45 page ebook. To me, it's a scratching of the surface. And almost every chapter, I recommend that people seek out uh, reputable professionals, uh, elder care attorneys, uh, financial planners, uh, other folks that are in this for a living and find out what their take on it is. And they will come up uh, with a more tailored type of a plan for someone. But, uh, you know, I really don't know even in the research I did, and there may be someone around like this, that anyone that specializes in just long-term care planning, uh, that's their main thing. I think that financial planners who are in general, cover general finances, have that as a subset of their expertise. But uh, uh, I haven't really yet run across anyone who does that, especially. Could, they very well could exist. I just didn't, didn't run across them. Something tells me that will become a specialty that grows in the next couple of decades. Oh, oh I, I don't think there's any question about it. Uh, that's another big thing that everyone's heard is that our baby boom generation is uh, really going to create a giant tsunami uh, here. It already is. And uh, it's only going to get bigger uh, for a while. So all the things we're talking about are going to continue to be uh, front page news, so to speak, uh, for a, quite a while. Yep. Um, uh, My hope is that the 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 tsunami of the baby boomers will kind of usher in enough changes that those of us that are old Gen Xers will benefit. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, I think I think I think that baby boomers will uh, help spur innovation in a lot of areas, and that uh, as the uh, other generations age, they'll be able to to take advantage of some of those changes that were made. Uh, along the way. I know that in other other uh, countries, they put more uh, emphasis on taking care of seniors, not necessarily direct payments for long-term care, but very, overall, uh, senior services are more robust in some uh, like European countries and so forth. So 
Um, one thing I did want to mention, we talked about uh, long-term care insurance and you had a, a great uh, uh, guest on, uh, you mentioned, to talk about that. I'll just mention a few things is, again, is that people um, uh, don't usually have, have a, a belief that long-term care insurance is really uh, out of the question. It's not affordable and all that kind of thing. Um, yes, that it is expensive, and that's that's. But the thing is, until you really look into it and start talking to people about it, specifics, you don't really know how. Is it truly out of your ballpark completely? Or well, what are the pros and cons of the whole thing? Um, so I think that that's that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and again, there's there's other combinations of things. So there's straight long-term care insurance just by itself. And then, as I mentioned, you can have a rider on a life insurance policy or an annuity even that does provide long-term care benefits. And what's interesting about that is that the traditional long-term care, one of the people things people don't buy it is that, well, what if I'm in the 30% or 50% that won't ever need it? I've just wasted my money. Well, there's that's a big you know perception thing. You could say the same thing about term life insurance. If you don't die when you have your term life policy, you, you haven't wasted that money. You covered a risk during a particular time. But uh, the interesting a- angle that uh, people should look into if they're interested in long-term care insurance is a life insurance policy or annuity with those kind of riders can be set up such that, for instance, for the life insurance, you, uh, if you don't need it, and it had a, it had some cash value attached to it, you would actually have some money coming back. So you would have some compensation for the for the the uh, premiums that you put in. So those are the kind of things people need to take into consideration. Uh, it's a more complex product that way because it's life insurance and LTCI, but it's worth looking into. And the same thing with an annuity that has a has a, a long term care uh, rider on it as well. So when you, if you uh, have if you have assets in the other buckets that we were speaking of earlier, you might need you might you might mitigate much of the risk of long term care needs with a smaller long term care insurance policy. Is what I'm yes. thinking. Yes, exactly right. And uh, one thing to think about for long term care, which I'm sure was covered in the, the prior segment too, is that. It's important to be very aware of what the exceptions are because they're, uh, my mother-in-law, uh, they actually did. I, I, met, I suggested that they hadn't planned very much, but they actually did have long-term care insurance. They bought it 20 years prior, but by the time it rolled around for them to use it, it didn't cover in-home health care. In the time that they bought it, that was not a thing uh, that people would use to pay outside people to come in so much. It was more for strict, I don't want to be, you know, I want to be my nursing home costs get paid. Well, she needed it uh, initially if she was going to pay for in-home health care, and it didn't cover that. She had to end up in an institution, a facility, before it would actually pay out. So those are the kind of things. (laughs) Yeah. So keeping in mind all the, the, the variety of things, and that's why I, I think the ebook is is a, a positive for people. Uh, it covers the waterfront, at least in a broad way, that people can think of it as a, a larger picture and and then uh, know really what the all the things that they have to think about, at least, uh, as they go into planning for long-term care. Well, it might nudge the people that think they're in the 30% to maybe stop believing that and maybe just kind of hope hope for the best and plan for the worst. Exactly. I hope this is a call to action for folks. Uh, you may not really, you may not do anything differently, but at least you have some sense perhaps of the, the range of, of options that might be before you that you might be able to take advantage of. Plus learning about them before you need them or before a loved one needs them is definitely a benefit because now you're not scrambling to go like, oh, now what do we do? <laughs> Which Precisely. I, I think that's yeah. an important thing. And yeah, it's not, and it's not just for the folks uh, who are going to actually need it. It's for, uh, it's worthwhile learning about it if you are a caregiver today so that you can get into conversations with parents uh, and so forth about, okay, uh, if you ever need this kind of care, uh, you have, what do you have in mind? And we knew that my mother-in-law had, uh, had that policy. 
Uh, and that at least was something that we could help help her with, uh, n- navigate that whole thing, even though it didn't pay for the part that she'd hoped it paid for at first. So, Now, is long-term so, care insurance something you can renew annually and maybe make those changes when home health care is now a thing? Because that's really frustrating. Like yeah. if you think about what yeah. changes could happen in the next 20 years, there's a lot of things long-term care might not pay for because we can't even imagine them today. Yes, exactly right. So that's why I would ask someone who was uh, marketing that kind of product, uh, what about 30, uh, 20, 30 years out from from here when I'll actually need it? Uh, let's talk about future. I mean, no one can predict that. <laughs> but uh, but at least to think about some possibilities about what uh, might happen is uh, worth it's worth a discussion at least. Because yeah, there's a lot of tech changes that are coming to make aging in place safer, better. You know, no that's just the stuff it. that's on the horizon right now. I can only imagine what's going to happen in 30 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, possibilities when it comes to technology and and how uh, that kind of thing. Care in some cultures now, there's already uh, uh, automated care right now, uh, robots and so forth that are being experimented with to uh, provide care for elders. So who knows? I always wonder when I read those articles about care robots, how my mom would have reacted to one of those. I think that would have been really interesting because I have no idea if it would have been that thing is weird. I don't want anything to do with it because, you know, she was born in 1943. So she wasn't, you know, Mm -hmm. super tech savvy. She was more tech savvy than a lot of women her age. Or she might have been fascinated by it, or she might not even have noticed it at the stage she was in. <laughs> so that's, you know, I kind of wonder at this point what that what that would be like. So I'll probably find mm-hmm. out. I've got another forty six and a half years to go. <laughs> <laughs> you may you may find a personal care robot uh, being a part of, part of the future that you might face. So we'll see. You never well, know. That is true. Well, I appreciate it. And if you could spell the name of the website for me, I'll make sure, sure. that's in the show notes so people can get the, the PDF, sure. the can- ebook. Sure. It's Cantissimo Senior Living. And uh, if you just provide that in the in the, the notes, um, that'd be fine. Uh, people can go there and find the ebook on this subject and other ebooks that I've written. Uh, on travel and uh, second homes and any number of things that uh, uh, have interest in that 55 plus demographic. And so Cantissimo is C-A-N-T, I-S-S-O? I-S-S-O. Yeah, I'll, um, I uh, will have to, you know, like, it's hard for me to even like think of <laughs> on the spot here how to spell it out loud. So like I say, it's probably going to be something that you'll want to put in the, 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 yeah. Notes. To, I just want to uh, make sure I get it right. Go there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate and actually, it. if you, mm-hmm. I think, I think if you put my name into the uh, web browser too, it'll bring it up as well. So can't get it, can't get away from being found on the yeah, internet. I've can been we? googled. I've been googled. <laughs> well, this has been fantastic. I greatly appreciate uh, your time, and th- I will definitely have the proper link so that you guys can grab the ebook or any of the other ones that Peter just mentioned and. Hopefully, like Peter said, this is definitely a call to action for some of us that we've had discussions in my household, but not a whole lot of planning. So maybe I'll tie the uh, AirPods to my husband's head, make him listen to this episode, (laughs) (laughs) tape him down. He's bald, so it'll work. (laughs) All right. Thanks so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.